I'm, I'm really glad to be here. It's a real opportunity. I was chatting with Facundo before when he was still working in his previous job and he had the vision for Ineco and he was so excited about it. It's really exciting to come here and see a lot of the dreams of the people I met them then coming to fruition. So today I want to talk about some of the work I've been doing with clinicians looking at patients who have language problems. And what I want to show you is if, the, if there is a single theme to my research, it's try, to try to look at one problem but use lots of different methods to look at them. And the reason I do this is all the methods that I have to understand the brain are very bad. If there was one good method, I would use that method. But since all of the methods I have are pretty bad, the best thing is to use different methods that have different weaknesses and hope that I get a consistent message. So I want to talk about some of the language difficulties we see in uh, people following stroke. And I want to, I want to start with a, uh, a classical clinical exam. So this is a neurologist, Bob Knight, giving a clinical exam to two different patients uh, who've both had damage to the left side of their brain and they're having problems speaking. And so I want to give the idea that there are different types of problems with speaking. And so uh, here, we'll, here we'll listen to one exam for one patient. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell me what happened when you had the stroke? Yeah. Uh, do you remember listening in the morning or the afternoon? This fellow can clearly understand what he's being asked, and he can try to do gestures to give responses, but his ability to produce speech is really impaired. And I want to contrast that to another patient, so the same neurologist giving a very similar to clinical exam, but this time to a, a, a patient who has a different uh, area of brain injury. If you can't understand that, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> This person didn't really comprehend his speech. If you didn't speak any English at all, it would sound like he was communicating fine. He had the pragmatics of language. He waited for the person to ask him a question, and then he responded. But so his speech is very fluid. He doesn't have problems producing speech. 
but he has a profound problem understanding what the questions are that he's asked. So later in the video, he's shown a screw, and it's clear he doesn't really know what he's supposed to do with it, that he's being asked how to use it. And so this patient is creating lots of jargon. He's, he's, he has very fluent sounding speech, but it's meaningless in terms of its content. And so it's a, a profoundly different problem. If you do want to sit down on a seat, feel free to. So, okay, so that's just a background to show you two of these patients. And one of the things I would say is language difficulties are incredibly profound uh, impacts on these individuals' lives. And I, I think maybe a lot of times we take for granted uh, just how, uh, for humans, language really is the way we get along. And, and so these people have very profound problems, but these two patients have a very different uh, form of problem. So I want to talk about some of the work that I've done with Julius Fridrickson, who's a speech and language pathologist, and Leo Bonilla, who's a neurologist. So for more than 100 years, we've recognized this dichotomy between these two types of patients. The first patient I showed you had a real difficulty producing speech. And so he really was struggling to find the speech. And he knew when he was making mistakes. He was trying to correct himself. But his speech production was very impaired. And so this is classically associated with damage to the left inferior frontal gyrus that I show in red, where the second patient is a classic example of someone who has damage to the posterior area of the brain, uh, the superior temporal gyrus, where they uh, have a, a tremendous problem when they produce speech. The speech production itself seems quite unimpaired. So again, if that person had been Chinese and you watched a video of the interaction with a neurologist, it would have seemed fine. He, he had normal sounding speech, he had pauses, he had all the pragmatics of speech. It was just that the contact was damaged. What I want to talk about today is this notion of whether Broca's area really just does speech production, or if maybe uh, it has some subtle effects. No one doubts it does do speech production, but maybe there's some other subtle features that you can see in these patients that give us some insights in terms of how to treat them and also might give us some insight in terms of how language evolved in humans. And so one of the popular uh, ideas now about language is looking at some of the work that's come from non-human primates like monkeys. And if you look at the same area as Broca's area in monkeys, well, these monkeys don't have speech. Uh, and so we can't quite see if they, if they have a language production problem. But what they do have in these same cells, in the same area of the brain, the left inferior frontal gyrus, so they're homolog of this, what we find is a lot of mirror neurons. And so this is uh, work that was originally done by Rizzolatti and his colleagues in Italy. And what you're seeing here is each one of these horizontal lines is a different trial in time. So what happens is, is that the, the cell they're recording from, there's recording from a single cell that's in the inferior frontal gyrus. And every time, I've got a point here, every time the, the monkey reaches for a raisin, right as the monkey starts re reaching, the cell starts firing a lot. So the cell is very active when the monkey reaches to grab something. So clearly, this would suggest that the cell does motor production. But interestingly, that same neuron will also respond very similarly when it sees a human grabbing and trying to reach for something. So when it observes another animal or, uh, uh, doing a similar task, the neuron fires as well. So these are what we now call mirror neurons, that they respond not only for producing an action, but for observing an action. And so a popular hypothesis, and one I want to try to explore a little bit today, is this idea that maybe the reason that left inferior frontal gyrus is crucial for language production in humans is that it's how we learn language. We've harnessed this system of mimicry, that if you want to learn how to speak language and produce language, you do it by observing your parents and adults around you producing speech, and you try to mimic them. And so one of the ideas we had based on this work is that maybe in humans, this area of the brain plays a special role in observing speech as well as producing speech. So there's a, the, no one argues that right, left inferior frontal gyrus is crucial for producing speech. But we wanted to see, can we find evidence that watching uh, speech involves this area? And so observation of speech uh, is tightly linked to this area. 
So the first tool I want to talk about using to look at this question is one that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with and some people are here are experts with, which is functional MRI. And so this is a technique where we can uh, infer brain activity in uh, humans and it has a major benefit over the single cell recording in monkeys that we don't actually have to put a needle inside people's brains. We can have them lie inside an MRI scanner and as they do an, a task or watch things, we can look for changes in their blood flow over time. So this is an example of my own brain and the motor strip of my brain. Every time that I uh, move my hand in this example of an experiment, I start tapping my, my left hand and on the right side of my brain, what I see is several seconds later, that area starts to become much brighter. So there's an uh, overcompensation of oxygen. There's an oxygen-related fact. And then I take a break and the signal goes down. And likewise, every time after I move my hand, you can see very regularly that there's this effect that this area of the brain is activating in, in sequence with my behavior. And so fMRI is a way that we can look at healthy people's brains and try to infer uh, their role in different tasks. And so our hypothesis is that if the left inferior frontal gyrus really has a special role in speech observation in humans, um, we should be able to see this in, in brain imaging studies so that when you observe speech, um, this area of the brain becomes particularly active. So this is the first study that we did to try to investigate this question. It was a very simple paradigm. People were lying down inside the MRI scan and we had them watch a computer screen. And on the computer screen, what they saw is they would see a silent video. So they didn't hear anything, but what they saw was lips moving on a computer screen. And some of the, and they'd always see two videos, one right after another. And so half the videos would show a speech movement. So you'd see a silent face that would be making pa, or ga, or da. So it's different syllables that you'd watch the face making. And your task was to say, were they making the same speech movement in the two videos? The other half of the video clips shown over here, what you saw was a person making a gurning movement. And so this is a larger one where the tongue is moving outside of the mouth. But we also had more subtle ones like kisses or other non-speech gestures of the mouth. So you were always watching a video of the mouth and you were always making a decision. And the decision was very simple. It was, were the two, was a pair of videos showing you exactly the same mouth movement or not. And what we wanted to know is, was there something special the, about the speech-related movements? When you were watching the speech-related movements, which areas of the brain were more active than when you were watching uh, the non-speech-related movements? And so in blue here, we're showing the areas that were more activated by the language, observing the language. And you see that on the left-hand side of the brain, we see really nicely Wernicke's area, which we expect for speech uh, comprehension. But we also saw this left inferior frontal gyrus speech production area. So we aren't asking people to produce any speech in these video clips, but what we see is when you watch the speech clip versus when you watch a non-speech clip, that area of the brain seems to be more activated. And so it was, a, it was a, a pattern of activity that was really consistent with this idea that left inferior frontal gyrus plays um, a crucial role in observing speech versus watching it. So that was our first study, and it was consistent with our belief, but there's sort of a fatal problem with this if you stop and think about it. And that is, maybe what people are doing to solve this task is that they're mimicking the task. So they see a face go pa, and they try to do pa, and if that's what they're doing, maybe the reason we're seeing a speech production area active is because they actually are producing speech when they do this task. And when they do the non-speech, when they watch a non-speech uh, face movement, they'd be using another part of the brain, and particularly uh, areas like the insula are areas that we found in a separate study that seem to be uh, active when you do novel mouth movements. So one possible criticism you could have with this finding, it's consistent with the notion, but it's possible that we see the speech production area active because implicitly we're asking people to produce the speech. So, there's a, there's a potential confound in the study. So the next study we did with uh, using the same fMRI technique and the same movies is we just decided to have a task where 
the mouth movements in the background would be totally irrelevant. All we did is ask people to watch the computer screen for a little object that would come up on top of the videos. And so this is an example where you'd watch videos and all you had to do is press a button whenever you saw a little cross flash up on the videos. So now the, the face movements were completely irrelevant. You didn't have to mimic them. You weren't looking to see if these two video clips were the same or different. All you were doing is looking for that little plus sign to appear. And we were interested to see what would happen. And again, our hypothesis was that if, uh, if, you, this, if your left inferior frontal gyrus is obligatorily involved in speech perception, this background image of the face moving, you won't help but have that area try to process it for you relative to non-speech movement. And so here we're showing now in orange the activity we found in left inferior frontal gyrus that again shows this pattern that that area is more active when you see the uh, speech movements than the non-speech movements, even though that activity is, um, that, that the movements are totally irrelevant and there's no uh, implicit incentive to move your lips at all to do this task. The task is simply to look for a very rare visual occurrence. So again, we find this evidence that seems to be consistent with the idea that left inferior frontal gyrus is doing something with observing speech. There is one big problem whenever we observe brain activity, and that is that maybe acti that seeing activity doesn't necessarily tell you that an area of the brain is critical for a task. And it could be that for all the data I've showed you so far, the reason we see Broca's area active isn't because it has anything to do with perceiving speech, but because it's incredibly heavily connected with Wernicke's area that does speech comprehension. And so when Wernicke's area is active doing something, the frontal area of the brain, because it's so connected, starts showing more activity even though you don't need it to do the task. It's involved with the task because it has sharp connections with an area that is. So one problem when we look at brain activity is we have a very weak inference. We don't have a strong causal relationship that you, we need this part of the brain to do the task. All we can say is when you do this task, we see this area of the brain being involved. So what I want to talk about is some of the work we've been doing where we don't just observe the brain, but we actually try to change how the brain works. And the idea is that if we change how the brain works and it influences your ability to do a task, it's a much stronger inference that we can say there's a causal relationship between the activity of this brain area and your ability to do this task. So the next day I want to show you, we're going to actually stimulate the left inferior frontal gyrus of the brain. And so we're going to change its activity while people observe speech. And this is the system that we used for this study, and it, I'm modeling it for you. And this is a technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation. And so above my head, you can see a magnetic wand. And normally, this wand doesn't have any magnetic field at it at all. But for a brief um, fraction of a millisecond, the wand will generate a very strong magnetic field, and that will induce the neurons in the brain uh, underneath its focus uh, to fire. So it creates an obligatory stimulation of my brain. And so the pulse that this system generates can be uh, a field strength similar to an MRI scanner, but it's incredibly brief and it's incredible, cr incredibly focused. So it's really going to only influence a small area of my brain. So our theory is, if I stimulate left inferior frontal gyrus while I'm perceiving speech videos, I should have a problem perceiving speech if that area of the brain really helps me observe speech. So that's what we were trying to do. So we use this wand over my head and over our participants' heads while they do this task. The problem with TMS days, there's a couple of, of difficulties that we have to deal with. And one is, when we apply a magnetic field pulse, it makes a very loud snapping sound. So it sounds like a whip was cracked right here. And so it's possible that if you have a very loud snapping sound, you're not as good at doing a task, not because of the brain activity, but because of the loud sound. The second thing is, it doesn't just induce your brain to fire, 
but it induces any muscles that are underneath the wand to uh, tense as well. So every time that we apply a TMS pulse, particularly to the front of your face, where you have all these facial muscles that help us make it, um, good expressions, your muscles will twitch. And so the feeling of a TMS wand in your scalp is almost as if someone was flicking your scalp. So you feel something. And particularly when you do it near the eyes, you tend to blink a little bit. And so you have a problem that if I'm watching videos, and I do more poorly watching videos when I have a TMS pulse, it could be because of the influence of the brain, or it could be because of the influence of my muscles. So to get around that problem, what we do is on half of our trials, we actually have a TMS wand stimulating my brain. On the other half of the trials, there's a second TMS system, which you can see here in the background, that's far enough away from my brain that it won't influence my brain, but it makes virtually an identical sound, particularly when I'm wearing earplugs. And on my scalp itself, you can see a little white patch here. What I have is I have two electrical patches that I put on my scalp, and I've titrated it so that it has exactly the same response to my scalp muscles as the real TMS. So on every trial, there's a cracking sound, and on every trial, my scalp twitches. But on only half of those trials am I actually going to stimulate the brain. So it's a very nice sham control condition. I think we're the only group, uh, at, this was done at Medical University of South Carolina, I think we're the only group that's actually using this uh, very elegant sham control technique. But it's a really nice way that I can tell you, as, as having piloted this experiment, that we actually, we, we titrate everything so you cannot tell what type of stimulation you're getting. And since the trials of brain stimulation and non-brain stimulation are interleaved with each other, you can never predict what's going to happen. All you know is you're getting ready for a trial and there's a cracking sound and your, your scalp twitches as the, as the video comes on. So that's how we tried to test this model. The other thing we did is for each individual, we take a copy of their uh, MRI scan of their brain. So this is my brain, and I'm wearing this uh, headband. And we use a, a neurosurgery camera system so that I can actually see where in my brain I'm stimulating. And so I'm able to actually uh, neuro-navigate and find the right area of my brain to stimulate. So I have a good idea that I'm over left inferior frontal gyrus. The other way that I know that I'm stimulating Broca's area is that when I get the wand in the right position, I start acting like that first patient video I showed you, that I have a problem producing speech well. And so we can actually, by um, stimulating left inferior frontal gyrus, we can induce speech arrest. And in some individuals, this is very profound and it's very similar to the patients. I can say personally with me, my speech arrest is pretty mild, and it sounds a little bit like I've been drinking a little bit too much. Uh, so we usually have people do things like count, where you'll say one, two, three, four. And you start sounding a little slurred. But what's really interesting with Broca's area stimulation is that your brain knows things aren't really happening quite like what you want them to. Right? You know you're making mistakes. And it, it's a very um, eerie sort of a feeling. I do think if you do these studies, you really need to with Broca's area, you need to be very careful to have an MRI scan and know where you're stimulating because you can actually move the wand back and hit motor cortex. And if you hit motor cortex, you get a very similar phenomena that you can get speech arrest from two different areas of the brain, one that uh, is Broca's area and one that's actually much more moving the muscles. So for this study, we tried to be very careful to make sure that we were specifically targeting Broca's area. So, the study was very similar to the imaging studies that we did. I watched very, we had participants watch two video clips. And half of the video clips showed speech movements, half showed non-speech movements. On every video clip, when the second video came, one of the TMS units fired and, uh, the left, and, and you had scalp contraction. But on, it was only on half of those trials we actually stimulated the brain. So what we were saying is there's actually a total of four conditions. There's seeing speech video versus seeing non-speech video, having brain stimulation versus not having brain stimulation. And our hypothesis was that stimulating the brain as you watch video should make it harder to distinguish them, and it should be specific to speech. 
Um, and this actually shows an example. We, for our individuals, we plotted where we were stimulating on their, on their brain scan. So that, I think, was the average for our group. Um, so this shows you the basic effect. And this is a bit of a complicated graph, so I'll try to walk you through it. On this side, I'm showing how accurate people were to determine what happened. And on this side, I'm trying to show you how fast people were. So this column shows when I saw non-speech movements. And this side, you can see what happened when the participants saw speech movements. And what you can see is the non-speech movements, people were a little bit faster to say if the videos were same or different. So they found the task a little bit easier in terms of speed. And the speech was a little bit slower. But the important thing is that we saw an interaction, that when there was a TMS pulse applied during the second video, people were particularly slow uh, to try to judge uh, whether this, the speech movements were the same versus um, when they had a sham. And that effect wasn't seen in the non-speech movements. And we know that this isn't just that people get slowed down in their responses. We can actually see a speed accuracy trade-off that uh, people, uh, the TMS pulse actually makes people less accurate at telling that the videos um, are different. So we have a very nice effect, a very nice interaction that says that TMS to frontal area influences m people's ability to, to recognize um, motor uh, facial movements, but particularly speech, spe uh, speech movements. So it seems like in adult humans at least, this area has become quite um, an expert at recognizing speech movements and, and that we rely on it to recognize speech movements. So uh, this is a way that we can try to use brain stimulation and, and we essentially try to guide our studies based on what we've seen in our brain imaging studies. And the imaging studies, we sort of get candidate areas and we say, these different parts of our brain seem to be involved with these tasks. And then with brain stimulation techniques, we can now say which of these areas are actually required by this task. So our conclusions from this is that there seems to be something special about how we use our left inferior frontal gyrus for observing speech. And um, you could argue if this is really support for a mirror neuron system or not, because what we do show is that the, there is a specific uh, relationship to observing speech. Observing relative, you could say that if it was just mirror neurons in this area of the brain, people would get worse at observing speech as well as observing non-speech. Both of those things you could think of it as using mirror neurons. And the adult humans, it seems to have gained a role that's uh, pretty strongly linked to language. There's something special about observing language with that area of the brain versus just observing the face. But working with speech language pathologists, when I get what I think is the final answer, they think it's where we should start looking at clinical solutions and clinical problems. And so, what we started to think about is, what can we do, what, what hypotheses do we have for uh, stroke patients who are having problems with speech? How can we use the findings uh, that, of recognizing that maybe this uh, frontal area is really involved with, with uh, speech comprehension? Uh, what can we start to do um, to look at stroke, both to test our theories as well as to see if we can deliver a better uh, clinical therapy. And so one of, the thing, one of the common problems that people who have damage to the left side of their brain have is anomia, and that's difficulty finding the right words. And I personally have this problem myself, even though I don't have brain injury. I'm sure all of us have this problem that we know the word we're trying to look for, but we can't exactly remember what it is. And so we show you a picture of a car, and I could say, you know, would you drive to work on this? And you'd say yes, but you can't remember that it's called the, the name car. You have problems remembering the right word. So we call that a difficulty in naming things, anomia. And it's one of the most common um, symptoms of left hemisphere damage that a lot of patients uh, complain about. And one of our ideas is if the inferior frontal gyrus really um, plays a role in speech comprehension, then uh, we should have some ability to predict how bad people's anomia is by looking at activity in this inferior frontal gyrus area. So um, what we did in this study 
is we had a group of 15 individuals who've all had brain injury. And we want to look at how, how much brain activity we see in their brain. And we want to compare that to how accurate they are at naming items. And so this is a little bit of a busy graph, so I'll try to walk, this, walk you through this. The first thing is on this brain scan, I'm showing you in blue and green, these are areas of the brain that are permanently destroyed in these patients. So it's a density plot that areas that are, um, are brighter in green are damaged in more of our patients. So they've all got middle cerebral artery territory. They've all got damage to this area of the brain. And you have this very um, large area that's damaged in these patients. The other thing we do is I'm showing you in red areas of their brain that are more active than neurologically healthy people. So our baseline is we're going to have people that are in the scanner, they're doing language tasks. Language areas of the brain should be active. What we're, what we're showing here is which areas are more active after you have brain damage when you do a language task than they are in healthy people. So it's a comparison. It's comparing against a gold standard. We know certain speech areas are going to be active. We want to say we're trying to get an idea which areas of the brain are trying to help compensate when people have brain injury. So we have people in the scanner trying to name items. And what we found is, as a group, uh, left inferior frontal gyrus is more active in patients who have uh, uh, brain injury than healthy controls. But what's really fascinating is if we actually look at the data of the patients and we say, how severe was their anomia? So these patients were up, up at 70. These people are doing very well at naming items. And these people are down at 20, are having a tremendously hard time naming items. And on this axis, I'm showing you how much activity they have in our area relative to healthy people. And so these patients are showing um, less activity than healthy people. And these areas are showing more activity uh, than healthy people. And what you can see is there's a, a, a reasonably strong relationship that the amount of activity over normal is showing people who are doing better. And so it's suggesting that if people can use this area, they can compensate for uh, speech disorder. So it's a, it's a biomarker that the activity in this region of the brain is actually predicting recovery, of their own internal spontaneous recovery of the brain. I think there's a lot of ways you can look at this data, and I wouldn't, I'm not trying to claim this is the answer to a problem, but it's consistent with this notion that, um, that uh, the left inferior frontal gyrus seems to be playing an important role in what we see in stroke patients. So I want to move on to uh, one final topic, which is what I think is the most exciting of the, the new line of research I've started, um, that builds off of everything I've shown you so far. And that is to try to say, now that we have this hypothesis that for people who have problems with language, it could be that this left inferior gyrus is really important to that. What we want to do is say, can we use that knowledge to actually change the treatment of these patients? How can we use our basic science to actually change people? So a really strong test and a, a really meaningful test for these people who have these profound language problems of our hypothesis is, can we stimulate inferior frontal gyrus to help people get better from naming deficits. And so we've now completed two studies. Um, I actually think the second one is, is more exciting, uh, but I'm going to talk about the first one because it more relates to the inferior frontal gyrus, so it fits the theme. But it's a, this, this shows you some of the consistent work we're doing. So we've used a technique that most people haven't heard of, and so I'm going to walk you through it a little bit um, and, and describe it. But it's, it's a technique that actually isn't brand new. Most people, this is the first time they've ever heard of it when I talk about it. And yet, uh, the data I'm showing you here was collected in 1964. Well, it was published in 1964. And so it's a technique we call transcranial direct current stimulation. And so what it means is we can apply an electrical current to the scalp of your brain, and we can change your brain's activity. And this can be shown very well in animals, where we can actually physically look at their activity of their brain. And so this is a study from 1964 done by Beinman and colleagues, where what they did is they're showing you here the axis of how far up and down is showing you how active 
the neurons are. So how many spikes every 10 seconds that are happening. So this neuron is, is sputtering along at a, a very consistent rate. And then they apply positive electrical current over the scalp. So they, for, a few, uh, for a few minutes, they're applying some electrical current. And then they stop the electrical current. And what you can see is that the baseline activity for the brain is faster. That same neuron is now firing faster. And then they apply some more electrical current. And after they're done, they've increased the baseline again of that area of the brain. And this baseline change, uh, depending on how long you, you add the stimulation, uh, lasts for several hours. So it's, it's a very sustained effect. This is where the stimulation's happening. But um, for a long time after, so many minutes after you've stopped the stimulation, you're still seeing a change in the rate of the brain. So a positive current can increase the activity. And likewise, a cathode, or a negative current, you have a, this is a neuron that's firing at about 20 spikes every 10 seconds. And then they apply some negative current. And after that, for here we've got two hours of activity where it's actually below baseline. So we've retarded the amount that it fires. So direct current stimulation is a way that we can change how the brain works. And the best way I can explain this to people who aren't familiar with TDCS is a lot more people are familiar with EEG and ERPs. And so if you think about it, ERPs and EEG take advantage of the fact that the neurons of our brain uh, are uh, on the surface, uh, the cortex of our brain are perpendicular to the surface and essentially are creating an electric dipole. And what we do with TDCS is instead of observing that dipole, we influence that dipole. We actually change the um, background uh, electrical gradient that the uh, neurons are in. The effects are subtle, so they're more subtle than what we see with, with TMS. But one of the nice things that we, we know from TDCS is it doesn't create completely spontaneous neural firing. So a neuron that wasn't going to fire doesn't fire in the way it does with TMS. And you don't have the long refractory period afterwards. What happens is that a cell that's firing fires faster or slower. So you're changing that baseline rate. So the nice thing with TDCS when used with stroke patients is there's no evidence at all that there's any chance of inducing a seizure. So one of the things we have to watch out with TMS is in a very few instances, and it seems like in extreme levels, TMS has been known to induce a seizure. And after brain injury, the risk of seizures is much higher. So we're always cautious about using TMS and stroke. With TECS, uh, there's no known concerns about uh, influencing seizures. And in, in fact, it's been used in the clinic. The first clinical report of TDCS was done by Lippel and Redfern, uh, where they used it to treat depressions and had uh, remarkably um, positive results. Um, and perhaps the reason we don't know more about it is that Unfortunately, their results were just uh, being published as there was a huge revolution in the, the uh, pharmaceutical drugs that were available for psychiatrists. And so those, that new revolution in drugs became the standard of treatment. And uh, people really forgot about TDCS until the last few years, where they've started to use uh, new brain imaging methods in, in healthy humans to show that these, you really do get quite similar effects in humans. Now, a lot of people are now starting to do TDCS, and there's a lot of reasons for it. One is, I've already said, you don't induce a seizure. The other advantage is it's really inexpensive. So the units that I use cost $250 each, and so you can compare US dollars. So you can compare that. Uh, one of my, my, the TMS study I showed you used two TMS stimulators, and they each cost me $50,000, right? So it's a huge difference. This is a small little. A device that's powered by a small 9-volt battery, so it's literally something we can give our patients to take home and work with. Um, there's an, and so it's very uh, inexpensive. It's something that we could really, if this works well, we can provide it as a tool. And the reason it's so cheap is that these units are mass-produced, but they're not produced for changing your brain. They're actually, this is a new way to actually in, uh, get drugs into your bodies. So you can use the electrical current to be a um, ionic pull, you can actually uh, inject people essentially with drugs without giving them an injection. So that's what's made these stimulators so cheap and the fact that they're very simple. 
What makes, I think, the work that my group's been doing uh, unique among the people who are starting to use TDCS, and one thing I'm a huge proponent of, is that we're really trying to make sure that there's no way that any of the effects we see are due to experimenter bias. We want to have a really good sham control. And so TDCS, the effects we see are pretty small. And the best way I try to tell you of a typical TDCS effect, there's some exceptions that I can tell you, but typically most of the TDCS effects we have are a little bit like having a cup of coffee, right? People, after they have a cup of coffee, they tend to respond faster to tasks, do a little bit better, but it's very hard for me to look at someone and try to say, did you have a coffee an hour ago or not? It's a pretty small effect. So whenever we have small behavioral effects, we're always worried about what we call the clever Hans effect, which is named after this horse who uh, for a long time a lot of people thought had incredible abilities to calculate numbers. And it turns out that the horse wasn't doing any mental arithmetic at all. In fact, he was doing something much more clever, and that was he had a good sense of crowd psychology. So he had a good sense of the anticipation of the crowd. As he, so he was kind of stomping his hoof if they would say, what's 4 plus 10? And he'd start stomping his hoof until he saw all the crowd getting really excited, and then he'd stop and he'd get an apple. So. Um, the point is, experimenter demand is something we really have to watch out for when we're working with subtle effects. That if I know that this person's getting uh, sham stimulation or they're getting cathodal stimulation, um, and if, it, if this works out, I'm going to be able to publish a paper and we can, we can apply for new grants. Even if I don't want it to influence a person, they might read my anticipation. And so what we need is a way that no one really knows what's happening. And so the system that we use is, this is the standard TDCS unit, and then I have a computer-controlled solid-state relay system. And what it does is it determines whether there's actually any current going to the person's brain and what type of current it is. So this uh, little device here makes it so the experimenter and the patient don't know what type of stimulation they're getting at any one time. And uh, the other thing we do with this study is, that the experimenter who gives the, who tests the patient, uh, who gives them their speech language therapy, isn't going to be the person who's going to examine them after they've had their therapy. We have two independent uh, speech language pathologists who are listening to audio recordings uh, who independently rate how well the person's anomia is after treatment. So I think this is a really exciting technique and I'm a proponent of it. I, I started out being a little dubious about small effects, but I have to say we, we, we're starting to get some pretty exciting findings with it. But I do think if you want to endeavor to look at this, you really want to make sure that there's no way you can know exactly what's happening when you collect data. So this is what our study looked like for, for treatment. So in our study, we're going to apply positive current to try to excite one area of the brain, to try to stimulate this area of the brain. And following uh, data that goes back to the 60s, we're putting the, in, our, in this study, we put the, the negative current on the shoulder, so kind of a neutral location. So we're essentially building a circuit from the top of the head to the bottom. But the, the parts, the neurons that are aligned to be influenced by this current are going to be on the front of the head. Now the question is, where do we put our electrical stimulator? So for every single patient, before we d give them any treatment, they lie in our scanner and they try to name words. And so this is one patient where you can see in dark here <coughs> area of permanent brain injury. And then here you can see uh, an area of brain activity. And we're able to find the peak in their left inferior frontal gyrus. And this is the area that for our first study, this was our target. So we used our, our navigation system to make sure that we could stimulate this very part, that very part in this individual's brain. So for different individuals, we're stimulating different locations of their brain. But for each individual, it seems to be the area that's important when they're successful at naming objects. And the reason we do that is we have lots of patients with different brain injury at different locations. And there's no one location that's spared in all these patients. The reason they come to see us is they're having problems with their language system. Their language system has some damage. So in our study, we looked at 10 people who were at least six months after stroke. So they're at the stage where most people think their recovery is very flat. And we used an fMRI to decide for each person where we'd stimulate. And for each person, they came to us and got two weeks of treatment. One week where we applied TDCS to their scalp, and another week where they got sham TMS. So uh, it was a, a blinded study. 
Uh, and the other thing I want to say is the actual therapy was administered by a computer. It's a computer controlled task. And that way the computer didn't vary depending on its expectations of whether the person was getting real or sham therapy. There was really a complete uh, isolation. So this is the individual. You can see the electrical stimulate, the, the TDCS box itself is, is hidden away and they're doing a computerized task. So this is every day? So they do it for one week every, every, day. every day for one week. It was actually five days of, of therapy. Once but it was a day? Once a day for one hour a day. So the dosage is, is going to be these people over one week have got five hours of stimulation. These people, when, they, when they're in the sham week, they go, get five computer training sessions uh, without uh, stimulation. So here are our results. And the first thing I would say is, as usual, these effects are pretty small. But uh, they're looking, uh, they were statistically reliable. So on this axis here, I'm showing you um, their improvement in terms of the number of words that they were able to uh, report. And time one is immediately when we stop the therapy, and time two is a week after we stop the therapy. In our most recent study, we've looked at this uh, three weeks out. And what we see is on the 25 words that the computer was trying to train them on, and they had different words for their sham and their TDCS uh, therapy, but those were counterbalanced across the different people. What we see is that when they had the real stimulation, they on average named um, a couple words more than when they had sham therapy. So both cases, they're better than zero. So they're getting better. The therapy, watching the computer and practicing on these words is making them get better. But the stimulation is making the therapy work better. It's helping out on the therapy. This panel here is showing you the words the computer was trying to train them on. So this is what the computer was training them on while they were getting brain stimulation. But in a sense, these are the, this panel here is the more exciting bit. This is when we look at words they weren't being treated on. These are words that, uh, a, a very large uh, 50 untreated words, where we saw, are they actually generalizing? Are they getting better on words that they weren't practicing? And so what we find is a very similar effect, that, that um, after uh, the sham treatment, uh, for just one hour a day for five days, what we see is, on average, they're naming something like uh, three words more than, uh, from the untreated group than if they had the sham stimulation. So we seem to see the sustained benefit from getting some treatment for just uh, one week. And, you know, I'm not saying these patients are cured, but it's kind of an exciting way that we can take a, a theoretical observation and try to uh, look at a clinical population that most people think is is uh, plateaued out and is unlikely to have any benefit and show some uh, impressive results. And I, I do think we're, we've got a few innovations and in our new study shows that I think we can even uh, build on these effects a little bit more. So uh, this is my last slide. And so I think the basic story I want to say is um, I, I think that the left, my, my own hypothesis is the left inferior frontal gyrus, clearly it's vital for speech production. And it seems to be part of a network that, that has some role in observing speech and helping with that. And uh, that we can use this information to try to actually enhance, uh, enhance uh, treatment uh, from, uh, from brain injury. So that's where we, are, where we are right now. It's still a little preliminary, but I think it's, it's kind of promising work. And we are hoping to uh, move into a much larger study to really look at these effects more. So thanks again. I'm happy to take any questions. I have one question, please. When you say, uh, for how long does the, the effect of this stimulation last? I, I think right. you said it, but I don't remember. So there's, there's been a lot of studies to look at that. And if you look at just on the neural level, we were stimulating one milliamp for, t for uh, it was actually a 20 minute long session when I think about it. For this study, it was a 20 minute long session. And there is a nice study by Nietzsche that uses exactly the same stimulation pattern in humans looking at motor evoked potential that you measure with TMS. And that looks like you'd have an effect that would last for about two hours till they return to baseline. So that's, 
So in other words, we, the, the studies that we, we have from humans using the same type of stimulation stuff says that the brain change we're doing is really only influencing them for a few hours. But the idea is if you can kickstart an area of the brain to start working while they're doing a task, you can actually have um, effects that last a very long time. And the, the, it's not a great study, it's not beyond criticism, but I think the most um, famous study that shows some of these effects is there's a paper by Dockery and colleagues that looks at TDCS applied to the frontal cortex of university students when they learn words. And what's crucial with their study is if you have the right TDCS as you're learning the words, these people are better remembering them six months and 12 months after they had the stimulation. And that sort of makes sense. If your memory works better, if you're encoding a word better, you should remember it better much later. So even though the stimulation there state was just for 20 minutes and then they were trained on some words, you could actually see the effects months later in university age students, which to me is always, I always think um, trying to help patients have neurological problems is a much easier problem because they have a lot of room for improvement. And when you work with university students, they should be at about their peak mental ca capacity. If it, evolutionarily, if they could drive their brain 10% harder and be better at things, you think evolution would have worked out a way to do that. Um, and it's surprising, but there are uh, consistent findings with, with neurologically healthy adults that say that the same effects uh, can be used. Very interesting. Thank you. Okay, I have thanks a lot because I really appreciate the strong convergent information from different methods. It's really good. I just had three questions from the first study that you showed. Mm -hmm. There is something like a motor activation in right. the in the in the first one. Mm -hmm. In this. Right. This is. This here. Uh, it's. it's how do you it looks like face area, doesn't it? I mean, it does, I mean this, this could be, face area is going to wrap down into the insula, but it could be an area that's connected to production. It's hard. I mean, again, I think, I think with this study, you can have a lot of criticisms of it. I agree with that. And certainly with the non-face movements, it looks to me like a lot of areas that are sensitive to visual motion are active. Yeah, and I think exactly. that suggests that the videos weren't particularly paired with each other, that there probably is more explicit motion here. Okay. And that's what's happening here in the, the back of the brain. So. Uh, it's very hard to come up with the perfect stimuli. But, I mean, I, I, I think each one of these studies I think you can criticize. I think taken I together, it seems it it's, seems like we're getting a consistent. I just was curious of yeah. why you should find more motor activation. Right. And in the in the TMEs, TMS right. study, I I didn't understand why uh, you have a um, uh, when you suppress the inferior frontal genes, why mm -hmm. you have a better accuracy for non-speech. So why does non-speech get better when you have TMS and non-TMS? I'm very glad you weren't a reviewer for my paper because it was something <laughs> I've, I've worried about a little bit. Um, I don't know. I mean, this is the elegant part of the data and this suggests it's not a speed error trade-off. This, as you can see from the error bars, is a significant effect. I have an explanation for it, but it's one of those wild and crazy explanations. <laughs> um, so patients who have prosopagnosia, so damage to the ventral part of their visual system, are very bad at recognizing faces. But they're better than you and I are at recognizing faces that are upside down. Okay, so normally we're much, there's a, there's a famous effect that you're much better to recognize faces that are right side up than upside down. Interestingly, patients who can't recognize faces anymore aren't, don't only really not show a difference between right side up and upside down faces. They're actually better with uh, upside down faces. And so people have interpreted that to say that there's some kind of an inhibitory process going on. And this is an area that the intact areas of the brain are the ones that you always use when a face doesn't meet its canonical form and it tries to recognize different objects. And it hasn't been practiced on right side up faces because there's another module that does that. So I've always had this theory that the non-speech stuff, and we have some other studies that look at this, but the non-speech stuff is being processed by uh, insula cortex. And so the idea, the wild, crazy idea that I have no evidence for, but it kind of makes a nice story, is that this effect is that uh, you're actually getting less interference from an area of the brain.
But, it, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complete speculation. I, I, I can't think of an elegant way to find more evidence for that. I suspect this might be a hard effect to replicate. But it's, a, it's a great question and, and one I worried about. No, oh, but it's very interesting. I mean, right. it's very hard to... So, so the training, the training of, the, of, the, of the, these guys, what, what was the type of training with these? For, the 25, for uh, these patients have, here. Yeah. Um, so this is a training paradigm that we had actually developed before we had TDCS2 that was based on um, visual. What happens is, is that um, you see a picture on the computer screen, like a flashlight. And then you hear a voice, and the voice either says flashlight or it says submarine. And you have two buttons. And if the, what, you, what the voice said matched the picture, you press the green button. And if they don't match, they pass, press the red button. So they have two large buttons. And what you do is you just have, they, they're just watching videos and deciding, is this the, did I hear the right term for this word? And so they go through a lot of those uh, pairings. And what we do is we, have it train them on, on uh, a very small list of words. Uh, in this case, it was 36 words. But in our other studies where we've done more speech treatment, treatment, they actually start getting harder and harder words as they go along, and it tries to be adapted. But for this one, we wanted to keep the list pretty small so we could, because we knew we, we were doing a, a pretty limited stimulation. But it's a very simple uh, matching paradigm. But the, but the idea behind it is that you see the, you see the object. Right. And there's a retrieval of the, right. of the concept. And then they hear the voice. Yeah. And of course they have to, you know, make, the to save, make, make the judgment. Right. And then you're, you're, active, you're trying to stimulate frontal cortex. Basically. Right. So, and the interesting thing with a lot of TDCS studies, and again, um, I think this ha it's very similar to talking about the differences between TMS and TDCS. TDCS studies that are successful seem to be having people actively engaged in the task and that you actually have to have the brain stimulation and the task kind of work on each other. And so the idea is you have to get that circuitry working. That you aren't, you, it's not obligatory to be active, but if it's active, it'll be working a little bit more. So, you, so the, the prevailing uh, convention of how to do a TDCS study is while you're stimulating, you actually are exercising that area of the brain. You know, I know you, you have this too, but you are doing other studies. So is there a relationship between the, you know, the performance and the TDS? I mean, the performance and the doing the task and then doing the test. I, I think these studies are too small to really tease it apart. I mean, this was 10 people. We've now done another study that I think is 15 people where we do posterior stimulation. So it's still limited. And we're using this, uh, we're applying for money to try to do a phase two study to actually. Uh, test a larger number, and then we could do very interesting things like that. Yeah. And I guess you're also doing with the lesion, the depth of the lesion of these kind of Right. Things. And one of the things we're trying to do in our, our next study that we want to get funded is we only want to do fMRI in a small portion to estimate where to stimulate. And then we want to say, really, for most clinicians, it's crazy to say this is a very inexpensive device, but you have to get a very expensive brain scan to do it, right? So we're trying to say if we can come up with uh, some some nice ways to infer where for, for different patients where they should get stimulated. One more. No. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. That was my question. Okay.